we've been talking recently. I love the the message that Antoine brought on uh, Easter. And uh, about thinking kingdom and the journey that that he took in order to come to this point. And for the next little while, we're going to be talking about what it means to be thinking kingdom. We're going through the parables uh, regarding what Jesus says the kingdom is like. And there's a lot of parables that talk about what the kingdom is like. And so we want to uh, take our time and look at these parables and absorb them, what they mean. So that our thinking can be renewed and transformed. So that wherever we go, we will see kingdom work. Wherever we are, we're kingdom representatives. Amen. Today we're going to take a look at one parable that I'm sure everyone knows in Matthew chapter 25. And this is, uh, this is the parable of the ten virgins. I think we're all familiar with it. And when I first looked at it, I, I was like, Antoine suggested it. And I said, oh, okay, wedding. This is going to be nice. This is going to be fun. But the more I studied it, the more my heart became a little weary and burdened. And the implication that it gave. So if you would, read with me in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the, wise one, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all, these virgin, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. May God bless the reading of his word and the, and the truth that it contains Therein. First of all, this is one really strange wedding. Uh, it didn't make hardly any sense at all to me until I learned and did a little research on it. And let me bring you up to date, kind of like how weddings played out. Because their weddings are a lot different from our weddings. Okay, so first, there's a matchmaking. Right? And then there's negotiations between the two families. When everyone's satisfied with that, then a date is set 
usually with a long betrothal period, maybe a year or two, and sometimes even longer, because they set this uh, they set this up when the, uh, a lot of times when they're children. So a future date is put in mind. So now the time comes, and the wedding is close at hand. So what happens is uh, the bridegroom and his friends, his party, goes over to the bride's house. And he gets his pride. And he brings his bride and the whole family back to his house. And then they have a party for seven days. Now that's a wedding. That's a wedding. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of drink. That's a lot of merrymaking. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money, exactly. So, it was a big, big event. And usually, the weddings uh, most often were held in the, in the harvest time, in the fall. After all the harvest is brought in, and there's time for relaxation and to make merry. So uh, here we find this parable where the bridegroom goes. And usually the bridegroom does go in the evening after dark. And he sends someone ahead of him to let the, uh, the bride's family know that he's on his way. So that they can... Get ready to receive him. And when he gets there, then they're all going to go back to his house and the festivities begin. So, here we have a parable that talks about this wedding and the bridegroom is on his way, but there's a delay. Nobody knows what the delay is. But it gets later and later and later into the evening. They're waiting for him. But he hasn't showed up yet. And they're probably talking about, you know, at first, wow, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a great time. So happy for you. I'm, I'm pretending I know what girls talk about, you know, to their, uh, to their friend, the, the bride. And... Uh, uh, we're going to have a great party and la 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 and all this and everything's going to be great. You're going to have such a good life together. And, uh, but then after a while as the evening goes on, they're kind of running out of things to talk about. The excitement kind of dims down a little bit. And uh, so uh, one by one they start drifting off to sleep and start dozing. Well, you know, if we're going to party this late, I better get a little cat nap in. You know, so I'll be ready to go the rest of the night. So uh, what we find is they're dozing. And then the cry comes. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. And they all wake up and they start to make preparations. Now see, what's important is, because these things are held after dark, they have these lights. We would call them torches. And it's kind of like a flat bowl on a stick. And they take a rag and wrap around them. So when it says they're trimming their lamps, they're wrapping the rag around them and dousing it with oil. But you know what? Only five of the bridesmaids have oil. And see, they're going to be traveling in dark, and it's a festive occasion, and they need to cast out a lot of light for the party to go back to the groom's house. But five of them didn't think to bring oil. They had nothing. So... What they said was, let us borrow some of your oil so that we can light the way to and, and uh, join the festivity. But the others said, no, there's not enough. 
only for us only. Go and buy some. And then come back and join us. Uh, so they went out at dark. And when there's a big festive occasion going on, uh, some of the shopkeepers stayed open late. They don't keep strict hours like we do today. Uh, they'd go knock on the door and they would be able to get some, purchase some. But you know, they had a little time running around trying to find someone to sell them some stuff. And so by the time they got back to the party and knocked on the groom's door, they were shut out. They had missed it all. This is a very powerful parable in what Jesus is saying. And it's obvious who the groom is, right? It's Jesus himself. And the bride is Christ. I mean, is the church. One thing that strikes us in this passage, in this parable is, we don't know the hour or the time. There could be delay in his coming back. Don't grow weary in expecting Jesus. Continue on with the work that's set before us. Don't be distracted, but keep our attention and our focus on Christ. There's one thing for sure. He is coming back. And we look forward to that time when he comes back and he calls us to himself. That'll be a joyful day. It'll be a joyful time for those who believe. But until that time, we have work that's laid out before us. The discipleship needs to continue. Let us not grow weary in reaching other people for the kingdom's sake. To, to share our love for God with other people. To disciple more people wherever we go. To be mindful. To look for that one that God has laid on our heart to bring alongside. And to tell him the things about God. So we should be continuously working and diligent. Notice, he was, they weren't... Uh, they weren't chastised for falling asleep. So we go on about our daily lives, but we need to be mindful and watchful and expectant of Christ's return. And I think the most sobering part of this parable is not everyone gets in. You know, they were all there. They were all ready to help, to merry make for this great uh, reunion, this union. But not everybody's going to make it. And what really stands out to me is in this parable, half were wise and half were not. And today when I was walking around and I was shaking hands and I was talking to people and I wonder which half is not going to make it. Because even though we cry out, Lord, Lord, Jesus says, I don't know you. Depart from me. And that really pulls me up short to examine my own self first and foremost. Is my heart right with God? 
Jesus made it clear in this parable. In verse 11, when the other virgins came also saying, Lord, open to us. And his answer was, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. You know, there's many people, there's many people who come to church who are active, who are participating in things. But we don't know the heart of each one who is sitting here. Only God knows that. Do you know your own heart when it comes to the Lord? I'm thinking, what a travesty to be so close and not know the Lord. To be so close and still get left out. So I think before we even begin to look outside the walls of the church, we need to focus on the inside the walls of the church. To share and to make sure do you know my Jesus? And only you know the answer to that. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in doing church. Show up on Wednesday night. Go to the FAQ. Show up on Sunday morning. Ah, uh, maybe I'll go to the Foundations of Faith class. Maybe not. But at least I make it to, to preaching. Okay, I can check that off for this week. It's so much more than that. Sometimes we get called up in going through the motions that we fail to realize are we living? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives? That's how we know that we belong to God. Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Joy, patience, peace, long-suffering? Or is it despair, despondency, general crabbiness? What are the fruits that are evident in your life? And I know this is not a, a very uplifting message. But this is one that we really need to take to heart. Are we living for Christ? Only you know that. And I tell you what, this was a real burden to me. I've been struggling with it for the last couple days, uh, thinking about it. God's desire is that each one of us come to Him. I can see on the outside, but I can't see your heart. And I don't want this day to go by that you don't come to know my Jesus. Because in my Jesus, you're going to find love. You're going to find peace. You're going to find what your soul has been longing for. Jesus said, They will know you are my disciples if you love one another and follow my commandments. As we take just this moment before we partake in communion this morning, I want you to really, I just pray that the Lord would examine your hearts. I mean, this is, this is really tough. It's heavy. But all eternity is at stake. I 
would desire each of you to know my Jesus. And those who do, is your life really evident of Jesus? What are the fruit that you're producing? tough and we have to walk that narrow path that leads to salvation I pray that in the in the stillness of this moment that we examine our lives and I pray that the Lord would and His beautiful, sweet Holy Spirit would speak to us all where we are right now. I know He's been speaking to me to the things that are in my life. But we have so much work to do before us.